Jing Mei Wu, best quality. Five months ago, after a crab dinner celebrating Chinese New Year, my mother gave me my life's importance, a jade pendant on a gold chain. The pendant was not a piece of jewelry I would have chosen for myself. It was almost the size of my little finger, a mottled green and white color, intricately carved. To me, the whole effect looked wrong, too large, too green, too garishly ornate. I stuffed the necklace in my lacquer box and forgot about it. But these days, I think about my life's importance. I wonder what it means, because my mother died three months ago, six days before my 36th birthday. And she's the only person I could have asked to tell me about life's importance, to help me understand my grief. I now wear that pendant every day. I think the carvings mean something, because shapes and details which I never seem to notice until after they're pointed out to me always mean something to Chinese people. I know I could ask Auntie Lindo, Auntie An Mei, or other Chinese friends, but I also know they would tell me a meaning that is different from what my mother intended. What if they tell me this curving line branching into three oval shapes is a pomegranate, and that my mother was wishing me fertility and posterity? What if my mother really meant the carvings were a branch of pears to give me purity and honesty? or 10,000-year droplets from the magic mountain giving me my life's direction and a thousand years of fame and immortality. And because I think about this all the time, I always notice other people wearing these same jade pendants. Not the flat rectangular medallions or the round white ones with holes in the middle, but ones like mine, a two-inch oblong of bright apple green. It's as though we were all sworn to the same secret covenant. So secret, we don't even know what we belong to. Last weekend, for example, I saw a bartender wearing one. As I fingered mine, I asked him, Where'd you get yours? My mother gave it to me, he said. I asked him why, which is a nosy question that only one Chinese person can ask another. In a crowd of Caucasians, two Chinese people are already like family. She gave it to me after I got divorced. I guess my mother's telling me I'm still worth something. And I knew by the wonder in his voice, that he had no idea what the pendant really meant. At last year's Chinese New Year dinner, my mother had cooked 11 crabs, one crab for each person, plus an extra. She and I had bought them on Stockton Street in Chinatown. We had walked down the steep hill from my parents' flat, which was actually the first floor of a six-unit building they owned on Leavenworth near California. Their place was only six blocks from where I worked as a copywriter for a small ad agency, so two or three times a week, I would drop by after work. My mother always had enough food to insist that I stay for dinner. That year, Chinese New Year fell on a Thursday, so I got off work early to help my mother shop. My mother was 71, but she still walked briskly along, her small body straight and purposeful, carrying a colorful flowery plastic bag. I dragged the metal shopping cart behind. Every time I went with her to Chinatown, she pointed out other Chinese women her age, Hong Kong ladies, she said, eyeing two finely dressed women in long, dark mink coats and perfect black hairdos. Cantonese, village people, she whispered as we passed women in knitted caps, bent over in layers of padded tops and men's vests. And my mother, wearing light blue polyester pants, a red sweater, and a child's green down jacket. She didn't look like anybody else. She had come here in 1949, at the end of a long journey that started in Kuei Lin in 1944. She had gone north to Chongqing, where she met my father, and then they were southeast to Shanghai, and fled farther south to Hong Kong, where the boat departed for San Francisco. My mother came from many different directions, and now she was huffing complaints and rhythm to her walk downhill. Even you don't want them. You stuck, she said. She was fuming again about the tenants who lived on the second floor. Two years ago, she had tried to evict them on the pretext that relatives from China were coming to live there. But the couple saw through her ruse to get around rent control. They said they wouldn't budge until she produced the relatives. And after that, I had to listen to her recount every new injustice this couple inflicted on her. My mother said the gray-haired man put too many bags in the garbage cans. Cost me extra. And the woman, a very elegant artist type with blonde hair, had supposedly painted the apartment in terrible red and green colors. 
awful, moaned my mother. And they take bath two, three times every day, running the water, running, 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 never stop. Last week, she said, growing angrier at each step, the Waigoran accused me. She referred to all Caucasians as Waigoran, foreigners. They say I put poison in a fish, kill that cat. What cat? I asked, even though I knew exactly which one she was talking about. I had seen that cat many times. It was a big one-eared tom with gray stripes who had learned to jump on the outside sill of my mother's kitchen window. My mother would stand on her tiptoes and bang the kitchen window to scare the cat away. And the cat would stand his ground, hissing back in response to her shouts. That cat always raising his tail to put a stink on my door, complained my mother. I once saw her chase him from her stairwell with a pot of boiling water. I was tempted to ask if she really had put poison in a fish, but I had learned never to take sides against my mother. So what happened to that cat, I asked. That cat gone, disappear. She threw her hands in the air and smiled, looking pleased for a moment before the scowl came back. And that man, he raised his hand like this, show me his ugly fist and call me worst Fukien Lane lady. I not from Fukien, <laughs> he know nothing, she said, satisfied she had put him in his place. On Stockton Street, we wandered from one fish store to another, looking for the liveliest crabs. Don't get a dead one, warned my mother in Chinese. Even a beggar won't eat a dead one. I poked the crabs with a pencil to see how feisty they were. If a crab grabbed on, I lifted it out and into a plastic sack. I lifted one crab this way, only to find one of his legs had been clamped onto by another crab. In the brief tug of war, my crab lost a limb. Put it back, whispered my mother. A missing leg is a bad sign on Chinese New Year. But a man in a white smock came up to us. He started talking loudly to my mother in Cantonese, and my mother, who spoke Cantonese so poorly it sounded just like her Mandarin, was talking loudly back, pointing to the crab and its missing leg. And after more sharp words, that crab and its leg were put into our sack. Doesn't matter, said my mother. This number 11, extra one. Back home, my mother unwrapped the crabs from their newspaper liners and then dumped them into a sink full of cold water. She brought out her old wooden board and cleaver and chopped the ginger and scallions and poured soy sauce and sesame oil into a shallow dish. The kitchen smelled of wet newspapers and Chinese fragrances. Then, one by one, she grabbed the crabs by their back, hoisted them out of the sink and shook them dry and awake. The crabs flexed their legs in midair between sink and stove. She stacked the crabs in a multi-leveled steamer that sat over two burners on the stove, put a lid on top, and lit the burners. I couldn't bear to watch, so I went to the dining room. When I was eight, I had played with the crab my mother had brought home for my birthday dinner. I had poked it and jumped back every time its claws reached out. And I determined that the crab and I had come to a great understanding when it finally heaved itself up and walked clear across the counter. But before I could even decide what to name my new pet, my mother had dropped it into a pot of cold water and placed it on the tall stove. I had watched with growing dread as the water heated up and the pot began to clatter with this crab trying to tap his way out of his own hot soup. To this day, I remember that crab screaming as he thrust one bright red claw out over the side of the bubbling pot. It must have been my own voice, because now I know, of course, that crabs have no vocal cords, and I also try to convince myself that they don't have enough brains to know the difference between a hot bath and a slow death. For our New Year celebration, my mother had invited her longtime friends, Lindo and Tin Zhang. Without even asking, my mother knew that meant including the Zhang's children, their son Vincent, who was 38 years old and still living at home, and their daughter Waverly, who was around my age. Vincent called to see if he could also bring his girlfriend, Lisa Lum. Waverly said she would bring her new fiancé, Rich Shields, who, like Waverly, was a tax attorney at Price Waterhouse. And she added that Shoshana, her four-year-old daughter from a previous marriage, wanted to know if my parents had a VCR so she could watch Pinocchio, just in case she got bored. My mother also reminded me to invite Mr. Chong, my old piano teacher, who still lived three blocks away at our old apartment. 
including my mother, father, and me, that made eleven people, but my mother had counted only ten, because to her way of thinking, Shoshana was just a child and didn't count, at least not as far as crabs were concerned. She hadn't considered that Waverly might not think the same way. When the platter of steaming crabs was passed around, Waverly was first, and she picked the best crab, the brightest, the plumpest, and put it on her daughter's plate. And then she picked the next best for Rich, and another good one for herself. And because she had learned this skill of choosing the best from her mother, it was only natural that her mother knew how to pick the next best ones for her husband, her son, his girlfriend, and herself. And my mother, of course, considered the four remaining crabs and gave the one that looked the best to old Chung, because he was nearly 90 and deserved that kind of respect. And then she picked another good one for my father. That left two on the platter, a large crab with a faded orange color, and number 11, which had the torn off leg. My mother shook the platter in front of me. Take it, already cold, said my mother. I was not too fond of crab, ever since I saw my birthday crab boiled alive, but I knew I could not refuse. That's the way Chinese mothers show they love their children, not through hugs and kisses, but with stern offerings of steamed dumplings, duck gizzards, and crab. I thought I was doing the right thing, taking the crab with the missing leg, but my mother cried, no, no, big one. You eat it. I cannot finish. I remember the hungry sounds everybody else was making, cracking the shells, sucking the crab meat out, scraping out tidbits with the ends of chopsticks, and my mother's quiet plate. I was the only one who noticed her prying open the shell, sniffing the crab's body, and then getting up to go to the kitchen, plate in hand. She returned without the crab, but with more bowls of soy sauce, ginger, and scallions. And then, a stomach's filled, Everybody started talking at once. Su Yan, called Auntie Lindo to my mother. Why you wear that collar? Auntie Lindo gestured with the crab leg to my mother's red sweater. How can you wear this collar anymore? Too young, she scolded. My mother acted as though this were a compliment. Emporium Capwell, she said. Nineteen dollar, cheaper than knit it myself. Auntie Lindo nodded her head as if the color were worth this price. And then she pointed her crab leg toward her future son-in-law, Rich, and said, See how this one doesn't know how to eat Chinese food? Crab isn't Chinese, said Waverly in her complaining voice. It was amazing how Waverly still sounded the way she did 25 years ago when we were 10, and she had announced to me in that same voice, You aren't a genius like me. Auntie Linda looked at her daughter with exasperation. How do you know what is Chinese, what is not Chinese? And then she turned to Rich and said with much authority, Why you are not eating the best part? And I saw Rich smiling back with amusement and not humility showing in his face. He had the same coloring as the crab on his plate, reddish hair, pale cream skin, and large dots of orange freckles. While he smirked, Auntie Lindo demonstrated the proper technique, poking a chopstick into the orange spongy part. You have to dig in here, get this out. The brain is most tastiest. You try. Waverly and Rich grimaced at each other, united in disgust. I heard Vincent and Lisa whisper to each other. Gross. And then they snickered too. Uncle Tin started laughing to himself to let us know he also had a private joke. Judging by his preamble of snorts and leg slaps, I figured he must have practiced this joke many times. I tell my daughter, hey. Why be poor? Marry rich. <laughs> he laughed loudly and then nudged Lisa, who was sitting next to him. Hey, don't you get it? <laughs> Look what happened. She gonna marry this guy here rich, cause I tell her to marry rich. <laughs> <laughs> when are you guys getting married? Asked Vincent. I should ask you the same thing said Waverly. Lisa looked embarrassed when Vincent ignored the question. Mom, I don't like crap, whined Shoshana. Nice haircut, Waverly said to me from across the table. Thanks. David always does a great job. <laughs> you mean you still go to that guy on Howard Street? Waverly asked, arching one eyebrow. Aren't you afraid? I could sense the danger, but I said it anyway. What do you mean, afraid? He's always very good. I mean, 
He is gay, Waverly said. He could have AIDS. And he is cutting your hair, which is like cutting a living tissue. Maybe I'm being paranoid being a mother, but you just can't be too safe these days. And I sat there feeling as if my hair were coated with disease. You should go see my guy, said Waverly. Mr. Rory, he does fabulous work, although he probably charges more than you are used to. I felt like screaming. She could be so sneaky with her insults. Every time I asked her the simplest of tax questions, for example, she could turn the conversation around and make it seem as if I were too cheap to pay for her legal advice. She'd say things like, I really don't like to talk about important tax matters, except in my office. I mean, what if you say something casual over lunch and I give you some casual advice and then you follow it and it's wrong because you didn't give me the full information? I feel terrible, and you would too, wouldn't you? At that crab dinner, I was so mad about what she said about my hair that I wanted to embarrass her, to reveal in front of everybody how petty she was. So I decided to confront her about the freelance work I'd done for her firm, eight pages of brochure copy on its tax services. The firm was now more than 30 days late in paying my invoice. Maybe I could afford Mr. Rory's prices if someone's firm paid me on time, <laughs> I said with a teasing grin. And I was pleased to see Waverly's reaction. She was genuinely flustered, speechless. I couldn't resist rubbing it in. I think it's pretty ironic that a big accounting firm can't even pay its bills on time. I mean, really, Waverly, what kind of place are you working for? Her face was dark and quiet. Hey, hey, you girls, no more fighting, said my father, as if Waverly and I were still children arguing over tricycles and crayon colors. That's right, we don't want to talk about this now, said Waverly quietly. So how do you think the giants are going to do, said Vincent, trying to be funny. Nobody laughed. I wasn't going to let her slip away this time. Well, every time I call you on the phone, you can't talk about it then either, I said. Waverly looked at Rich, who shrugged his shoulders. She turned back to me and sighed. Listen, June, I don't know how to tell you this. That stuff you wrote, well, the firm decided it was unacceptable. You're lying. You said it was great. Waverly sighed again. I know I did. I didn't want to hurt your feelings. I was trying to see if we could fix it somehow, but it won't work. And just like that, I was starting to flail, toss without warnings into deep water, drowning and desperate. Most copy needs fine-tuning, I said. It's normal not to be perfect the first time. I should have explained the process better. June, I really don't think rewrites are free. I'm just as concerned about making it perfect as you are. Waverly acted as if she didn't even hear me. I'm trying to convince them to at least pay you for some of your time. I know you put a lot of work into it. I owe you at least that for even suggesting you do it. Just tell me what they want changed. I'll call you next week so we can go over it line by line. June... I can't, Waverly said with cool finality. It's just not <laughs> sophisticated. I'm sure what you write for your other clients is wonderful, but we're a big firm. We need somebody who understands that, our style. <laughs> she said this touching her hand to her chest, as if she were referring to her style. Then she laughed in a lighthearted way. <laughs> I mean, really, June. <laughs> And then she started speaking in a deep television announcer voice. Three benefits, three needs, three reasons to buy. Satisfaction guaranteed for today's and tomorrow's tax needs. She said this in such a funny way that everybody thought it was a good joke and laughed. And then to make matters worse, I heard my mother saying to Waverly, True, cannot teach style. Jew not sophisticate like you. Must be born this way. I was surprised at myself, how humiliated I felt. I had been outsmarted by Waverly once again, and now betrayed by my own mother. I was smiling so hard, my lower lip was twitching from the strain. I tried to find something else to concentrate on, and I remember picking up my plate, and then Mr. Chong's, as if I were clearing the table, and seeing so sharply through my tears the chips on the edges of these old plates, wondering why my mother didn't use the new set I had bought her five years ago. The table was littered with crab carcasses. Waverly and Rich lit cigarettes and put a crab shell between them for an ashtray. 
Shoshana had wandered over to the piano and was banging notes out with a crab claw in each hand. Mr. Chong, who had grown totally deaf over the years, watched Shoshana and applauded. Bravo, bravo. And except for his strange shouts, nobody said a word. My mother went to the kitchen and returned with a plate of oranges sliced into wedges. My father poked at the remnants of his crab. Vincent cleared his throat twice and then patted Lisa's hand. It was Auntie Lindo who finally spoke. Waverly, you let her try again. You make her do too fast first time. Of course she cannot get it right. I could hear my mother eating an orange slice. She was the only person I knew who crunched oranges, making it sound as if she were eating crisp apples instead. The sound of it was worse than gnashing teeth. Good one, take time, continued Auntie Lindo, nodding her head in agreement with herself. Put in lot of action, advised Uncle Tin. Lot of action, boy, that's what I like. Hey, that's all you need. Make it right. Probably not, I said, and smiled before carrying the plates to the sink. That was the night in the kitchen that I realized I was no better than who I was. I was a copywriter. I worked for a small ad agency. I promised every new client, we can provide the sizzle for the meat. The sizzle always boiled down to three benefits, three needs, three reasons to buy. The meat was always coaxial cable, T1 multiplexers, protocol converters, and the like. I was very good at what I did, succeeding at something small like that. I turned on the water to wash the dishes, and I no longer felt angry at Waverly. I felt tired and foolish, as if I had been running to escape someone chasing me, only to look behind and discover there was no one there. I picked up my mother's plate the one she had carried into the kitchen at the start of the dinner. The crab was untouched. I lifted the shell and smelled the crab. Maybe it was because I didn't like crab in the first place. I couldn't tell what was wrong with it. After everybody left, my mother joined me in the kitchen. I was putting dishes away. She put water on for more tea and sat down at the small kitchen table. I waited for her to chastise me. Good dinner, Ma, I said politely. Not so good, she said, jabbing at her mouth with a toothpick. What happened to your crab? Why'd you throw it away? Not so good, she said again. That crab die. Even a beggar don't want it. How could you tell? I didn't smell anything wrong. Can tell even before cook. She was standing now, looking out the kitchen window into the night. I shake that crab before cook. His legs droopy, his mouth wide open, already like a dead person. Why did you cook it if you knew it was already dead? I thought, maybe only just die. Maybe taste not too bad, but I can smell dead taste, not firm. What if someone else had picked that crab? My mother looked at me and smiled. Only you picked that crab. Nobody else take it. I already know this. Everybody else want best quality. You, thinking different. She said it in a way as if this were proof. Proof of something good. She always said things that didn't make any sense, that sounded both good and bad at the same time. I was putting away the last of the chip plates, and then I remembered something else. Ma, why don't you ever use those new dishes I bought you? If you didn't like them, you should have told me I could have changed the pattern. Of course I like, she said, irritated. Sometime I think something is so good, I want to save it. Then I forget I save it. And then, as if she had just now remembered, she unhooked the clasp of her gold necklace and took it off, wadding the chain and the jade pendant in her palm. She grabbed my hand and put the necklace in my palm, then shut my fingers around it. No, Ma, I protested. I can't take this. Nolly, Nolly. Take it, take it, she said, as if she was scolding me. And then she continued in Chinese. For a long time, I wanted to give you this necklace. See, I wore this on my skin. So when you put it on your skin, then you know my meaning. This is your life's importance. I looked at the necklace, the pendant with the light green jade. I wanted to give it back. I didn't want to accept it. And yet, I also felt as if I had already swallowed it. You're giving this to me only because of what happened tonight, I finally said. What happened? 
what Waverly said, what everybody said. Why you listen to her? Why you want to follow behind her, chasing her words? She is like this crap. My mother poked a shell in the garbage can. Always walking sideways, moving crooked. You can make your legs go the other way. I put the necklace on. It felt cool. Not so good, this jade, she said matter-of-factly, touching the pendant. And then she added in Chinese, This is young jade. It is a very light color now, but if you wear it every day, it will become more green. My father hasn't eaten well since my mother died, so I'm here, in the kitchen, to cook him dinner. I'm slicing tofu. I've decided to make him a spicy bean curd dish. My mother used to tell me how hot things restore the spirit and health, but I'm making this mostly because I know my father loves this dish and I know how to cook it. I like the smell of it. Ginger scallions and a red chili sauce that tickles my nose the minute I open the jar. Above me, I hear the old pipes shake into action with a thunk, and then the water running in my sink dwindles to a trickle. One of the tenants upstairs must be taking a shower. I remember my mother complaining. Even you don't want them. You stuck. And now, I know what she meant. As I rinse the tofu in the sink, I am startled by a dark mass that appears suddenly at the window. It's the one-eared tomcat from upstairs. He's balancing on the sill, rubbing his flank against the window. My mother didn't kill that damn cat after all, and I'm relieved. And then I see this cat rubbing more vigorously on the window, and he starts to raise his tail. Get away from there, I shout, and slap my hands on the window three times. But the cat just narrows his eyes, flattens his one ear, and hisses back at me. Thank you.